Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dutiful Future. Just jumping straight in here today. I am joined by the Westminster and Brexit reporter for Politics Home, formerly of Business Insider, Adam Payne, at Adam Payne26 on Twitter. Adam, hello. Hello, thank you for having me back. I'm joining you and your listeners from inside Parliament. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can only apologise if there's any background noise or you see uh, an MP who you're not a particularly big fan of walking behind me or something. <laughs> no problem uh, at all. But- it'll... it'll- provide a lovely uh, an ambiance to the podcast mm. uh, as you said this is your second time on the podcast um mm. i've done the numbers here it was exactly 482 days ago uh or in other words really? last may uh, or may of last year uh where we talked about um brexit and covid covering the crises great mm. great podcast i'd recommend everyone check it out uh so what with the the news headlines uh of food shortages of um weatherspoons not being able to get carling uh, of Greg's not being able to get enough pies and pasties. Um, society somehow hasn't collapsed yet, but I thought now would be the best time to talk talk about probably the, the greatest Brexit expert in uh, the United Kingdom world of journalism, Adam Payne, about it. Uh, so once again, thanks so much for being here. And uh, let's just jump straight in. So um, obviously the main headlines that we've seen and a lot of the work that you've been writing on recently for Politics Home has been about food shortages. So if you could just give us a sort of like a quick introduction to what the issue is and why it's happening. Mm, well, that that was a very generous description of me. Uh, so, <laughs> actually, if I agree, but thank you very much. Accurate. Um, so, so why why are Greg's, McDonald's, Nando's running out of things? Well, it, it's complex. Um, Brexit is an issue. It's it's a factor. It's not the whole mm-hmm. um, reason. Um, that sometimes gets lost, I think, in some of the Twitter debates. Uh, you get people who say this is completely down to Brexit. You have others who say Brexit's got nothing to do with this. Um, The truth is somewhere in the middle. Brexit is very much something to do with this, but it's one of several reasons. Mm -hmm. So what's actually going on? So in in this country, we have had a shortage of lorry drivers uh, for a number of years now. Why is that? It's not a very attractive profession. Um, It's not paid particularly well. You don't see a lot of your family. You have to spend a lot of nights sleeping in layabies. Mm -hmm. Um, And because of that, um, it's an aging working population. Not many young people at all are lorry drivers. Uh, They are mainly older people. And many of them during the pandemic have retired or have left the profession um, Mm. altogether. So it's important to stress that we've had a shortage of lorry drivers in this country for a long time. This isn't something that's new or that's been created by Brexit. But what's happened in the last year or so is, firstly, during the pandemic, um, it's well, it's worth saying, actually, that lots of um, people who have driven lorries in this country who have delivered things to supermarkets to food outlets what what have you are european uh, Mm -hmm. often from eastern europe what's happened in the last year or so is that lots of those people during the pandemic have gone home they've left the united kingdom um and as i said that's happened during the pandemic but also lots of those people did that because of brexit um and because of that they have left a pretty massive hole in an already um, I don't know, in, in a workforce which already already wasn't big enough. Um, now, if we were still in the European Union, if, if we still had the free movement of people, um, one would suspect that lots of those European drivers would come back to the UK and take up those jobs. Yeah. But because at the moment, um, the government's post-Brexit immigration system makes it a lot harder for those people to come over and take up the jobs. So to sort of summarise that, um, we have a lorry driver shortage crisis, which has been many years in the making, which has been compounded, sort of um, made a lot worse very quickly by COVID and Brexit. And, you know, it's not just lorry drivers. Um, If you look across the supply chain, you've got people who pick fruit and veg. You've got people who process meat. Uh, you've got um, so, so if you think about the various parts of a supply chain and how things get from point A to point B, um, we have shortages essentially all over the place at the moment. Mm-hmm. And, and what and what's the result of that? Well, it means that um, deliveries of things are being delayed, and that's why you're seeing 
excuse me. And that's why you're seeing empty supermarket shelves. You're seeing mm-hmm. McDonald's run out of certain items. Um, but it's not just food. Um, we've seen IKEA, I think last week, said that um, I think 10% of IKEA's product range has been affected by delays because they don't have enough drivers. Um, so, you know, and, it, and it's, I, I think if I was to try and get something across in this, in this conversation, it's that there's no obvious solution really mm-hmm. um the government's argument is well instead of relying on immigration we should be training more british people to do these jobs it's all well and good um mm-hmm. there are arguments as to whether that's realistic or at least whether it's realistic that we can hire and train enough british people to in the numbers we need um but even if it was achievable it would take many many months mm-hmm. um at least and this is a crisis which is happening right now um so you know this isn't something that's going to be fixed next week um we are heading in although i know we're sat here talking in a september in a very beautiful september day in london at least um but if you're a business um you're essentially in the run-up to christmas now you're preparing your christmas stock um and it's it's going to be a it's going to be a bumpy unless the government perform you know I think it's going to be a bumpy few months. And then you consider, which, you know, we might talk about shortly, the fact that the government, as as things stand, uh, are planning to introduce checks on mm-hmm. goods which come to the UK from the EU. That's going to be an added layer of complication, an added layer of delay. And we're looking at a pretty bumpy few months in the run-up mm-hmm. to Christmas. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of the talk around this has been about the run-up to Christmas where obviously... Um consumer demand skyrockets uh, and where a lot of these shortages will really uh, start to be to be felt even more extreme so right now we're seeing you go you know you go to go to your mcdonald's and some things are missing some certain products you go to your greg's there's something missing how much worse do you see this problem getting or does it do you think it will stay as more of this constant level of individual products are missing but as a whole generally it's the same or could you see um these Mm. crises just getting worse and worse to the point where there are there is you know like in the beginning of the pandemic where supermarkets would be cleared out due to panic obviously for different reasons but could you see a situation similar to that i think um obviously at the moment the reason perhaps the vast majority of people aren't massively worried about this is the shortages we're seeing are quite random Mm -hmm. they're dispersed and the effect on the individual isn't that huge so you might walk into greg's tomorrow and you might notice that there isn't there isn't a chicken bake and that might be annoying yeah uh, particularly if you're a chicken bake fan um but ultimately it's, it's not it's no it's not a threat to your health you're not going to mm-hmm. starve to death um and equally you know i've done big i've you know been to the supermarket recently and i'll notice that some of the items i've ordered are available so they'll substitute them and they're obviously sort of minor inconveniences yeah. but they're not they're not they're not you know enormous disruptions to one's life um could it get worse than that i think i think it could because um in the run-up to christmas any christmas regardless of you know brexit of covid of of the current labor shortages any christmas period is busy um demand for food in particular but other things rockets Mm -hmm. um and i think with that in mind i think we i think the short i think we could see more shortages and i think as well what's worth bearing in mind is around christmas time around Christmas time, we are talking about certain products, aren't we? We're talking about certain food we like to eat on Christmas day. Mm. We're talking about toys. Um, and if there are shortages of those things, yeah, then suddenly I think more people are going to notice. I think more people are going to be annoyed. Um, add to the mix, potentially checks on goods coming from the EU. Mm-hmm. And we get a lot of our food from the EU. I think we get like... Um, I think around two thirds of our fruit and veg and two thirds of our cheese from the EU, for example, wow. that might be wrong. Yeah, you might have to, uh, you might have to. <laughs> On screen <laughs> I think now. <laughs> I, think, I think that's about right. Um, sure. You know, and it, it, we do, there could be, um, there's, there's definitely potential for, you know, a perfect storm. Mm-hmm. Um, so rather than, you know, I, I certainly don't see, I certainly don't see things getting better mm-hmm. um, over the next few weeks. I, I think they could get, I think they could get worse. Yes. Sure. I think on this issue, you know, you mentioned there isn't really uh, an obvious solution. Um, there have been calls for, um, do you remember the exact term, but something, something along the gist of 
emergency visas for truck drivers from the EU to sort of mm. fast track them through. Um, however, I think a lot of the time, similar to um, the uh, Brexit in Northern Ireland, which you may be able to get, get onto later, the government strategy appears to have been a lot of delaying things, delaying checks being imposed, delaying um, changes to certain rules and regulations. Um, do you see that? So in the government's response right now, do you see that there is sort of a, a desire to sort of just postpone a lot of the consequences for as long as possible? And if so, do you think there will be a sort of a, a cliff's edge at some point? Or, you know, why might this be? Or, you know, am I, am I totally wrong in this assessment? Um, I, well, I think there are two things going on. Firstly, I think j- just thinking about Brexit, and you mentioned Northern Ireland, um, the government has delayed mm-hmm. um, a lot of the consequences of Brexit. So um, obviously we left the single market and customs union on New Year's Eve. The trade deal came into effect on January 1st. But the implications of that, i.e. we're going to have to start checking a lot of goods, all mm-hmm. of the goods which come from the EU, the government has decided to postpone that. Um, so really, mm-hmm. the British consumer is yet to experience yeah. the reality of Brexit. Um, consumers in, in Europe who buy things from Britain have experienced it because the EU um, implemented its own post-Brexit checks immediately, mm-hmm. whereas we didn't. Um, um, and regards to Northern Ireland, something similar is happening in that I mean, we, we could talk for hours about Northern Ireland, but I mean, to mm-hmm. try and abbreviate it, it sort of um, drastically, um, the government there is extending grace periods, postponing things in order to minimise disruption for the people of Northern Ireland. Now, when it comes to labour shortages and lorry drivers, I guess the issue, the blockage at least, is that just about every industry business group has said, look, please, government, can mm-hmm. you add lorry drivers? Can you add, yeah. I don't know, processors, pickers to um, the shortage occupation list, which essentially just means, please, can you make it a lot easier for these people to come and take jobs in the UK? Because right now, because they're deemed low skilled mm-hmm. and, you know, there's a whole argument whether whether that's a fair description. Um please, can you make it easier for them people to come over here? And the government right now is saying no. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's not going to say yes um, anytime soon. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's going to change its mind. It's very adamant that it doesn't want to use immigration uh, to as a means of fixing this problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I said earlier that I don't see a quick natural fix to this. Mm-hmm. I, I, things aren't just going to get better because, you know, because... Sure. No, it's you can't apply that old British sense of you know uh, it'll be all right. Yeah, keep calm, uh, carry on. Yeah, like things will sort themselves out. In this case, I know I, I don't I, that doesn't really apply. Mm-hmm. Um, Why do you think so, they are so reluctant to to use the city? They have a reluctance to use immigration to solve problems. Do you think this is this is sort of a uh, a Brexit puritanism, puritanism ideological commitment to um, being against the concept, or do you think it's much more sort of a um, I guess more cynical political approach of we don't want to admit that something that we have campaigned against is would be helpful or would be good. I think there is, I know this sounds obvious, there's a lot of politics at work. So hmm. the government, the government has a very clear vision of Brexit. It's got an idea of Brexit. And part of that idea, part of that vision is um, a certain approach to immigration, mm-hmm. uh, i.e., they want, you know, they don't want to be seen as relying on EU migration to sure. fix problems at home. They they want British people to be doing these jobs. They want to create jobs for British people. So I think that that is pretty much where it comes from. From a very clear, some some would argue, sort of dogmatic yeah. idea of what Brexit should be, what Bre- what Brexit should entail. Um, I think that's why. Um, and 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 you know the argument they put forward that you know ultimately we want we want more people we want more British people to do these jobs. I think that's a completely reasonable argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I said before, the problem is even if you accept that, and even even if you accept that we could 
hire and train enough British people to fill all the gaps in the, in the labour market, that is going to take a hell of a long time. Yeah. We'd probably be sat here this time next year and it, and it still would be in process. Whereas the problems we're talking about, um, you know, McDonald's running out of stuff and um, sure. the co-op not having, I don't know, sandwiches, mm-hmm. are things <laughs> which is happening right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that's why you, you have at the moment this standoff between business and government. Business is sort of screaming, please give us this, even if it's just a short term thing. You know, we're not sure. we're not asking for this forever, just for, a, you know, maybe a year or so as we ride out the post COVID sort of economic storm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the government isn't isn't giving them it. And, and, as, and as I said, it doesn't look like I had a comp before speaking to you today, Hugh, I had a conversation with a business figure who had a, had a meeting with government this week and said, mm-hmm. we've got, they've had no indication at all that the government was open to changing their mind on it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an interesting one. It seems almost like a hearkening back to the sort of like um, neoliberal concept of when structural change happens, when there's big changes in the economy, we simply just have to shift, you know, hope individuals will shift naturally along that. But it, it almost seems almost denial of reality. Like you said, you know, truck driving, for example, isn't a very attractive prospect for lots of um, lots of younger people in, you know, who are who are British nationals and isn't something that people are leaning towards. And there doesn't seem to be too much of a, too much action in the terms of encouraging entering in this industry, actually um, you know, trying to move people in these areas. It just seems to be a little bit more of, it'll happen eventually, we're sure. Um, and I think mm. that sort of harkens back to when we talk about a lot of delaying and a lot of Brexit issues where it's postponing these these consequences, whether it be for Northern Ireland, whether it be for consumers in general. Um, but beyond purely just uh, the consumer consequences, you know, you've written a lot about general industry consequences as well with, um, with Politics Home, in the article about, um, uh, yeah, post-Brexit, the UK food industry will be around 2 billion worse off. Um, mm. How... Do you see there to be uh, so a lot of the Brexit rhetoric in terms of you know oh we'll lose EU business but we'll gain you know the rest of the world we can make deals with Australia with America is there any prospect for a you know rest of the world um, alliances maybe keeping that up or is this something which is either incredibly long term or just isn't very realistic in your opinion? Um, well, the short answer is no. Uh, the, the longer answer um, is that you're right in the. Um, you referenced the Food and Drink Federation figures which came out last week or the week before. My mm. grasp of time sort of collapsed. Um, and, and those figures did show that um, exports to the rest of the world, i.e. non-EU countries, was starting to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it returned to pre-COVID levels, which is good. And um, as we sign more free trade deals with the likes of New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia, um, it will have a a trade boosting effect but the problem is that um any um increase to sales to the rest of the world will not come close yeah remotely close to offsetting what is being lost to the eu why is that it's because the eu is by far our biggest trading partner um why is why is that well it's because trade believe it or not is is about geography Mm -hmm. um the reason we can sell fish to people in the eu or, or we could previously anyway was because we could get that fish from yeah. i don't know scotland to paris um in 36 hours you can't yeah. do that with new zealand um for obvious reasons mm. i don't need to you know like patronize your listeners and why that is <laughs> um so you know trade is confined by the realities of geography yeah and um ultimately you know trade with the rest of the world will never come close i'd say to, to making up what's being lost um mm-hmm. to the eu and as you said the food and drink federation estimates that the uk industry so all the food and drink companies in in the country are collectively about two billion pounds um worse off compared to 2019 now some of that of course will be covid sure. um because the closure of hospitality had a massive impact on um, demand for food and drink but their conclusion was in a large part it, it was the result of brexit and the fact that um brexit has resulted in a series of barriers mm-hmm. to trade with the eu um and that was always going to happen like you know despite despite the rhetoric and the claims brexit particularly the version of brexit um 
pursued and delivered by this government was always mm -hmm. going to equal um, a lot of a lot more cost and complexity if you want to sell um, sell to or indeed buy things from Europe. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one because you know we've been talking a lot about sort of the negative consequences that we can expect or that we're already seeing. Um, and you know, as we said before, there isn't really any sort of obvious solution. But could you see there being any sort of like large diverging path that could be taken? You know, say there was a massive reshuffle of the government. Say the Green Party won the won in a random snap mm -hmm. election tomorrow. If there was some sort of radical shift in leadership in the country, could there be any sort of large changes that could change this trajectory of just increasing complications and increasing uh, consequences and increasing costs to several different industries? Or is this really a, was this an inevitable consequence from the, you know, the, the, the decision that was made back in the, uh, in the referendum? Mm. Sorry if you just heard the chime of a clock, by the way. I didn't um, at all, don't worry. <laughs> um, well, the UK's relationship with the EU will always be changing. It mm -hmm. will always be evolving. As we said earlier, we're still in the process of negotiating um, what it means for Northern Ireland. Um, the UK's relationship with Europe will never be static. And of course, if there is a change in government, whether that be a new prime minister or indeed a new party, let's say the Labour Party mm -hmm. eventually won an election. I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. Um, if they eventually won an election, you'd think they'd want a lot closer ties with Europe and sure. they well and they may well renegotiate the UK relationship with the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, the Labour Party at the moment is calling for a veterinary agreement and essentially that just means we want a closer relationship with the EU. We want to do away with lots of these checks and um, a lot of this paperwork. So yeah, I certainly think there's, you know, who am I to predict, you know, who's going to win the next election mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and and who Boris Johnson, you know, if it is going to be the Tories again, who Boris Johnson's success is going to be or, you know, so I, I think there's certainly scope for that to change. Absolutely. I mean, the EU's an expert in ongoing negotiations. It's been negotiating with Switzerland for about 30 years or you know, something. Um, so I think there's certainly scope for it to change. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, is, is it going to change in the next, I don't know, few months yeah under this government um I, i'd be very very surprised sure flabbergasted mm -hmm. P purely as a as a political issue um how long lasting do you see brexit being in terms of political debate and political discourse and being at the forefront of um you know the public's minds uh you know when we talk about uh democracy in general we often see you know flips and party from year to year do you could you see Every single time a leadership eventually changes, Brexit is on the dock, there's changing in the relationship with the EU to certain degrees, you know, moving from like a Swiss style deal to more independent side. Um, or could you potentially see Brexit sort of just after we, we potentially weather some sort of storm with the consequences that we've been talking about, it's sort of fading back into a more background and technical issue for um, hmm. us, us, us nerds, us politics nerds. Well, I think obviously Brexit, until COVID was the biggest political issue yeah. since Iraq, probably, um, for a few years. Mm -hmm. Then COVID replaced that. Um, and now I think it's fair to say that although Brexit does, on a regular basis, appear in the news bulletins, so sure. whether it's Northern Ireland, whether it's things, whether it's us running out of sandwiches, um, it, it's, all, it's, it's rarely the top story. And... I don't think it's I don't think it's the most important issue for most people anymore. I think the most important issue for people is COVID. Mm -hmm. I think their economic security, um, things like that. Um, but I think Brexit will always be bubbling away. I don't think it's going away yeah. because um, you mentioned Northern Ireland. That's going to be rolling on uh, f for a long time. Um, the effects of Brexit. Um, on our trade, on our supplies, food supplies is going to be ongoing. As I said, we've not even introduced checks on EU imports yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's meant to happen in October. I actually reported today that the government is considering delaying that again. Yeah. Uh, so that might be next year. So I think, you know, do, do I think that Brexit will become the biggest issue again? <sighs> it, it, it's, it's difficult to envisage that mm -hmm. um, unless in 10 years time, you know, the Labour Party adopted a position of we want a referendum on rejoining. I mean, that could happen. I, I, 
who yeah. knows where it'll be in 10 years time but i think in the near in the next few years mm-hmm. i.e pre-election um i don't know though i mean if if come christmas time there are shortages of everyone's favorite festive foods and Brexit's being blamed for that, then you could easily envisage a scenario where suddenly Brexit becomes the top story in, in the, in the um, mm-hmm. news again. If chunky Kit Kats get out of um, shop sales, I'm, I'm going to cause a problem. Um, mm. That is my, that's on the top of my list of things that need to be remaining uh, in the UK. Uh, I don't well, care that, how it happens, that, but you know, that's why I, th- I think, you know, if, pe- if people's Christmas dinners get ruined, mm-hmm. yeah, then um, I think suddenly Brexit might become an issue in, <laughs> In, sure. in a way, you know, and because at the moment, I think, you know, if we're being completely self-reflective, like the, the, what I'm writing at the moment about uh, the story I wrote today about um, the government potentially delaying yeah. EU import checks, um, it'd be a, you know, de- I think it'd be, it'd be in the news bulletin. Some people would care, but ultimately a lot of people would be like, mm, I don't know what that means for me. Sure. So I'm not really bothered. Um and that partly, I think, is why the government is considering doing it because yeah. the government delays checks again is a much smaller story than shit, we're running out of food. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry for, for swearing. Totally fine. <laughs> I, I, ho- ho- I hope it's allowed on your podcast. It's not the um, first time and it definitely won't be the last. <laughs> brilliant. Um, so, yeah, Bre- Brexit, I mean, it, it's not going away. Mm-hmm. Certainly not going away. I mean, but, the, but right now, it's clearly not the biggest issue. It's yeah. one off. I mean, in any other year, the fact that we're <laughs> running out of stuff, yeah, probably would be the, you know, the, 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 or, or the fact that, you know, Northern Ireland is in such a existential place at the mm-hmm. moment would be the biggest story. But you know, well, yeah, we are we're, so we're, much, we're, so much. We're in a on. very unique mm-hmm. news it, cycle. Yeah. A very unique, just general situation mm-hmm. <clears throat> at the moment. I likely see Brexit becoming one of those issues where, despite its its major importance and impacts, like we described in several different areas, it will be constantly in the background influencing things, but won't be commonly discussed that much. It won't be brought up an incredible amount mm-hmm. until something like, you know, mass food shortages really kicks in. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think one thing that really put it into perspective for me uh, in terms of how much Brexit is impacting and will impact our lives in the future um, was your article with... Um, uh, the drummer from from Blur talking about how oh, yes. it will impact the um, the music industry. Um, mm. Would you would you wouldn't mind doing like a quick summary of what this issue was? I think it's a perfect encapsulation of how Brexit will go so much further than just complicated regulations and tariffs and imports. Mm. Of course, yes, you're you're really testing my Brexit knowledge here. Um, <laughs> so essentially, to try and summarise. Um, when we're in the European Union, because free, because of the free movement of people, um, musicians and artists and actors mm-hmm. and creative types could travel freely across Europe and perform. So, you know, that they could perform in Vienna one night and then drive to Berlin and perform there. Mm-hmm. And, and they could do, you know, they could do a Europe wide tour, which la- might last six weeks. And sure. Won't be any issues. Um, the issue now is that because we're not in the free movement of people anymore, and the UK and the EU in its trade deal failed to include um, a provision allowing sort of um, um, the free free travel, yeah. free movement of performers. Mm-hmm. Now, performing artists um, face if you want to do a, a tour of Europe suddenly it's become a hell of a lot more complex because each country has their own different rules. Um, Some countries are more sort of are easier to perform in than others. So Mm -hmm. the one that comes like Spain is the one that's worrying a lot of performers at the moment. because I think you need a visa to perform in Spain and they're very expensive. Um, If you are a blur, you know, a massive band with lots of money, um, such costs are annoying, but you can probably afford to pay for them. If you're an up and coming band, yeah, you know, a, a young who, who who really rely on these tours to for exposure mm-hmm. and, and to and to get you know to get your name out there, yeah, they won't be able to afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're adding hundreds of pounds to every day to the European tour, suddenly by the end you're racking up thousands of pounds of um, red tape. Yeah. It's not feasible, and not only that, <clears throat> um. 
due to our new relationship with the EU, there are now new rules for how many stops um, uh, a British lorry can make in Europe. So obviously, oh, wow. when bands or um, when bands or I don't know stage shows go on tour in Europe, ah, okay. uh, they're, they're taken around. Their equipment will be taken by lorry. Okay. Interesting. Um, pre- previously, um, those lorries like the people could travel freely there was no restrictions on how many times they stopped or how many places they visited um now um they are limited to three stops in europe um and then they have to return to the uk now obviously you, you can imagine here if you're a band and you're trying to tour europe mm-hmm. if your lorry can only stop three times legally that's a problem yeah um what does that mean in practice it means that bands instead are just going to use European lorries who are affected by this. That in turn means that British companies, yeah. logistic companies are going to be used less. Mm-hmm. They're going to lose money. They're going to lose business and probably jobs will be lost. Um, now it's worth saying that the government is in sort of ongoing negotiations with individual okay. EU countries rather than EU itself um, to try and sort this out. Um, it's got the, it's arranged, it's managed to agree visa free arrangements with 19 of the 27 EU countries. But even among those 19, you know, there are still issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and I guess you, COVID in a way has masked this because yeah. live, live music, you know, has been dormant for the last, yeah. God knows how long because of COVID. Obviously, it, it's beginning to return in this country. I went to, been to a few gigs myself in recent weeks but in europe it's only just starting to return so mm-hmm. this hasn't really been that visible but if you're thinking about next year perhaps like european festival scene will be back so many festivals in europe where british bands play that's when it'll really yeah. be felt because mm-hmm. these particularly these smaller british bands um who usually might support like let's say if blur are playing they might have two or three support acts um a lot less of them are going to be making it to Europe because yeah. of the associated costs. Mm-hmm. I think it, it, it's a very interesting one to talk about because I really think that um, it is a great way of, of really demonstrating to people how how much Brexit is going to impact our future lives. And I think that um, you know, on a rumber, rather somber note, it almost seems like the worst is yet to come. A lot of these consequences that we've talked about have seemed to be are either being delayed or are being postponed or... Um, are likely to be felt more and more in the future. And I think that keeping this issue in mind is something that's very important, um, which is why I would just like to say thank you so much for agreeing to come on, uh, Adam. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's always this, a pleasure. This has been um, fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing your your fantastic knowledge with us. I would recommend that everyone uh, follow uh, Adam Payne on Twitter at Adam Payne 26 uh, Check out his work with Politics Home. It's all fantastic. And if you want to keep up with the incredibly complicated issue that is Brexit, it is the place to be, in my opinion. Uh, Adam, once again, thanks so much for coming on. And I hope to chat to you again soon. Well, thank you for having me. I apologise, as I said, for any uh, interruptions from the Houses of Parliament. Um, and I hope your listeners are all very healthy and well and have enjoyed their summers. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been lovely having you on, everyone. Like and subscribe. Thanks for thanks for watching and listening.